Okay, we're good. Okay. Okay. So back to this. Uh, you know, it's a real, real pleasure to be able to invite Elizabeth Rosner and to have her accept the invitation. Um, she's a best-selling novelist, poet, and essayist living in Berkeley right now. She's coming to us from the East Coast from her father's house, her father who features very prominently in Survivor Cafe, which is the foundation for our conversation, but we will range beyond that. It's her first book of nonfiction. I came to Elizabeth's work through her fiction, including Electric City and The Speed of Light and The Blue Nude. I also knew her poetry before coming upon this book. So I'm, I'm grateful for her voice in the world and for this moment that we get to hear her voice on Zoom. Um, Ani Tashin has uh, work most recently appeared in the Bangalore Review with an essay called The Shape of Us, Exploring Post-Genocide Identity. And I'll put a link to that in the chat just so that you have it later if you want it. And back and forth, is, there it is. So Ani's work appears in um, Cytron Review, Bird Thumb, Foliate Review and others. She's a teacher. She teaches creative writing here in the Bay Area. She's been awarded residencies at Vona and the Vermont Studio Center. And she's a graduate of the St. Mary's um, College Masters of Fine Arts and Creative Writing program. And I'm a fan of Ani and have been for a very long time. And I think you'll see why today. Uh, when we're thinking about this moment, um, one day after the 20th anniversary of 9-11, uh, we did not plan to have this conversation on this day. Second Sunday of uh, the month is where, where our readings lie, but I think it's fitting. Um, Edwin Dondekat in a New Yorker article in September of 2011, 10 years after 9-11 um, and also just after a very large earthquake in her country, said this, uh, we are often told we must not compare tragedies, but how can we not when we experience them in the same body and with the same mind? Past horrors give us a language with which to define new ones. Worldwide terrors become personalized. Mm -hmm. And randomly came upon that quote today. And I think it speaks to the larger conversation. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more about what's coming up at Alta Mesa Center for the Arts later, but I'm going to back into the, uh, the, the, the wallpaper. If you'd like to see a clear view of our speakers, there's a button on the top that says view, and if you click on it, it will have two options. One is gallery and one is speaker. If you click on the speaker, you will have a closer and more um, intimate view of the people who are actually speaking. Mute yourselves if you haven't already. I will find you and mute you if you are not, um, but please do use the chat for your questions. Our speakers won't address them right away, but we'll use them to, to, to see where we all are and where we are all thinking. So thank you. And I will um, hand it over now to our speakers. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I, I wanted to say thank you also to Elizabeth for doing this and writing this book because um, if you if you um, read my work, you know, like it's basically <laughs> what my one of my obsessions, um, you know, my writerly obsessions um, about writing um, through trauma. And so when I read Elizabeth's book, I was just, you know, she's a breast cancer survivor. Um, she, uh, you know, is a descendant of a Holocaust survivor. Um, there are so many parallels here. Um, and this book is um, so um, is it's sadly almost relevant. Um, I feel like it comes up for me every few years um, where um, I, you know, I, I look and I take a, a read from this a chapter. Um, so Elizabeth, I just I just want to thank you first and thank you to Alta Mesa for um, having this discussion. It's not an easy one. <laughs> um, so what um, Elizabeth, we, if we could just dive in um, what why do you feel that um, memoir is a way uh, to address these issues? I'm just going to go right in there. <laughs> Good. Good to start. Um, 
at the heart of it all, which is why, you know, why we write what we write and, um, and how much of what we choose is voluntary and how much of it is involuntary. I think so much of what I say right at the start of Survivor Cafe, that, that this is a book I essentially have been writing my entire life. In many ways, as you just said, this feels like um, the material that was given to me. This is, um, this is quite literally the story of my inheritance, even though my effort was to go far beyond just my personal inheritance of, of the legacy of two Holocaust survivors, both of my parents and all of my grandparents too. Um, but, to, but to try to address this question, not only of what do I carry as a result of what I was born into, but how does that not only set me apart from others who don't share that history, but actually the opposite. How does it connect me with others who share their own version of inheritance, whether it's a literal lineage of suffering, genocide, atrocity, or whether it's somehow an indirect and more collective holding of that history that we all share. For example, simply by being born in America, you are, whether you like it or not, inheriting a land that was stolen from the indigenous people who were here, and then a land that was the place of tremendous suffering and enslavement of people who were brought here against their will from another continent. And so to say, well, I'm an American, I don't connect to genocide is I think to really miss the point of, of what we all share, whether we wanna name it that way or not. And so my effort in this book was, was to use my experience um, as a lens, as, as, a, as a framing, but to keep diving into it, to deepen my own way of, of naming what I feel I carry, but also to use that as a way of asking questions. What do you carry? What, how, does, how have you been shaped by what you carry? And then what do we do with all of that? which is part of, I think, the conversation we're here to have too, is what is the aftermath of atrocity, not just in the form of trauma, but in the form of, say, resilience, in the form of greater empathy for the suffering of others. There are all sorts of ways that we can see it as not to simplify it and call it a gift, but, but to see what it, what it enables us to do in a, in a wider sense. And I mean, ad and address. I mean, I completely agree, <laughs> obviously. And I and I I love I love the part in this book that is. I mean, it's it's almost like it's um, deceptively simple. The alphabet. Um, I, and can you talk to us a little bit more about that that alphabet and what? Um, yeah, what inspired sure. you? To that? Yeah. So. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, let me just say quickly that um, that the book is is framed. Um, well, there's a thread that runs through it in the form of three different trips that I took to Germany with my father to visit the site of the Buchenwald concentration camp where he had been a prisoner when he was a teenager. And those three journeys are, are interwoven with a tremendous amount of research that I did into um, other atrocities and genocides and other questions of remembrance and our understanding now increasingly nuanced understanding of epigenetics, which is defined very simplistically for now as um, the modification of the expression of DNA by environmental events such as trauma. And so in the weaving together of all of this material, as I was writing, I reached many points where I was quite overwhelmed by the, you know, I think the heaviness, the darkness, the pain of what I was reading about and learning and, and visiting, you know, emotionally. And 
I just sat down one day and wrote out this alphabet of what I called the alphabet of inadequate language because words started feeling really meager to me when I was trying to talk about things that were so complicated and so layered and so really ineffable that that language kept failing me. And so it wasn't necessarily intended to be part of the book when I wrote it. It was almost a kind of exercise in purging my own um, feeling of my being inadequate, not just language, but my my own ability. And and then when I looked at it and I shared it with a friend of mine, the writer Susan Griffin, she said, "Oh my gosh, this is this is a poem, you know." And it and it really it addresses all the things you've been writing about. And, and I realized that it was in a way, it was a map for the book. It was, I call it sometimes an alternative table of contents, but in that book, in that alphabet, I was really saying, we use words sometimes so casually, like now, for example, you know, we use the word trauma all day long as, as if we all agree what that means. And the truth is, Trauma is so, so complicated and truly individual. Even though we talk about collective trauma, we talk about historical trauma, we talk about, you know, event based trauma, we talk about physiological trauma, we have all sorts of subcategories for trauma, but the word itself is, is at risk of losing its meaning because of its overuse, I think. And, and yet at the same time, it becomes a shorthand for a lot of things that we need to be able to talk about. So all of those things I was trying to, to speak about um, in one way or another with the use of that alphabet. And so it, it became the, the frontispiece for the book, you know, the, the kind of the way in the portal to everything else. Would you mind reading just a little bit of that first? Sure. Um, that yeah. First bit? We're having requests in the chat. So I thought I would. Yeah. Okay. Comment. Yeah. <laughs> And just to say, um, you know, it goes from A to Z and it's and it's a, a few pages long. So I'll just read a few, a few of the letters. The alphabet of inadequate language. A is for Auschwitz, where more than a million were gassed and then burned into ash. The word that could speak for everything that follows. A is for Arbeit macht frei, the words on the gates of Auschwitz, work makes you free, except that the phrase is untranslatable like so much else. A is for atrocity. A is for Armenian genocide, words that are illegal to say aloud in Turkey. A is for atom bomb. B is for Buchenwald, where my father and my uncle were imprisoned yet did not die. F is for final solution. F is for Führer. F is for fatherland. F is for forgetting, which both is and is not the opposite of remembering. O is for oven. O is for other. Q is for quarantine. Q is for questions that have no answer. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It just hearing you read it too, it's um it's really um visceral, you know. Um and of course, so I opened this book, you know, um when it came out and I I, I get to Armenian genocide and I, I stopped because mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that in this book about you know, the Jewish Holocaust that, you know, I, I was being seen somehow, you know, of course, like as a reader, right? As a writer, I love the technique of A to Z. As a, as a reader, I was, um, I, I just felt seen. And we talked a little bit about this when we met briefly, briefly, excuse me. Um, what, so, so um, how do you feel, so we talked, you talked about traumas and how they um, are different. So how do we talk about one while acknowledging the other? That's such a key question, Ani. And first of all, I just want to say I'm so glad and grateful that even just by saying those words that you as a reader felt included, you know, in the text in some way and therefore included in, in the world of um, 
shared history. And, and that that is really so deeply my intention is that as much as we do need on some fundamental level to feel ourselves unique, to feel ourselves identified as some tribal this or that, you know, that, that we belong to a particular set of beliefs or we belong to a particular family or community. At the same time, for me, I grew up hearing that, you know, I was a chosen Jew or that that the Holocaust was unique and you couldn't compare it to anything and you should never discuss any other genocide when you're talking about the Holocaust. And I really had to get to the point where even as a child, I was I was not willing to agree to that. I think even early on in my life, I had this sense that I didn't want to keep measuring and separating and comparing and essentially competing for what what maybe felt like attention or validation or acknowledgement, and instead to recognize that actually um, the human experience connects us for better and for worse. And that when I learned that Hitler would refer to the Armenian genocide as a way of saying, I'm going to get away with this. I am going to erase the Jews. I am going to exterminate every last Jew and no one will stop me. And how do I know? Because who remembers the Armenians? And, and Goebbels said it. I mean, his, his you know, top advisors, they were all convinced that the Armenian genocide was a way of reassuring them that they could wipe out a human you know, race, a, a, a portion of the human population, and no one would come to their rescue. And, and so for me, long before I ever met anyone of Armenian descent, I felt that connection was there. And, and later in my life, when I started to realize that I was growing up in a region of, of upstate New York, where I am right now, stolen land from, you know, the Iroquois nation, that all of these names of places surrounding me were names that belonged to a vanished people, and yet no one was telling the story of that. And so I think I just had this early awareness that it was my responsibility as, as a person, as a, as a compassionate human, to see what we all have in common and how that connection can help us do some kind of restorative justice, some kind of recovery of our of our deep human connection, so that um, so that atrocities don't perpetuate. And yet, of course, in my lifetime, atrocities perpetuate. So, you know, is it a failed cause? I'm not giving up yet, but um, but I but I do believe that this connected conversation is essential. I do too, and I, I and def we definitely do need more compassion, don't we? <laughs> I mean, we can never have enough compassion, and, and it feels it almost feels like we have less compassion um, in, in the world as you know as we go along, and maybe because there's so many people, I'm not sure, but um, I mean, I guess the point I'm coming to is you know the the importance of telling stories, like why. So we we've, we've heard Armenian genocide stories, we've heard you know Holocaust stories. Why keep retelling them? And um, it's because we can't. I mean, you can disagree or <laughs> or not, um, Elizabeth, but um, yeah, that we we need to keep telling these stories because um, our memories are very faulty, right? As a people. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the so the subtitle of Survivor Cafe is the legacy of trauma and the labyrinth of memory. And right. so I was really very deliberately trying to address the interconnectedness of those issues of, of how our collective amnesia at times um, dooms us to the repetition of trauma, dooms us to the retention of, of the aftermath of trauma. And so how do we unravel all of that? How do we accept that memory is faulty, elusive, problematic, that 
that in fact, often the more we repeat a story, the more we rewrite that story. There's all sorts of brain science and memory science and studies showing that we don't just keep solidifying that story by retelling it, we alter it ever so slightly, even without our intending to. And so this idea that we have to just accept that that's part of human nature, that's part of the way the brain works, that's part of the way storytelling functions, but it's not just repetition for the sake of repetition. It, I think what you're getting at, Ani, is this idea that um, telling the story is one thing, feeling heard is another. And that's why, you know, I wanted to really underscore the fact that you said you felt seen and just noting words on a page that I had offered, you know, what does it feel like to know that somebody is not just waiting for their turn to tell their story to you, but, but really deeply listening to your story allowing it to enter them fully to the point where they really, you said you felt seen, you know, that, that is one of the most beautiful gifts we can give to each other when we listen deeply. And, and to say that it's just a story is, is to really diminish the impact that that can have. We can be, we can be molecularly transformed by deeply taking in someone's story. And, and then, and then what, you know, Elie Wiesel famously said, and, and, and this bears repeating a thousand times, you know, when you listen to a witness, you become a witness. So this idea that hearing a story really actually gives you a sense of obligation now to do something, to address what that story contains. So when you hear a, a black person talk about how systemic racism impacts them daily, hourly, how their children are affected, how their lives are constrained. You know, it's not enough just to say, I'm sorry, that's how your life is, or I had no idea or whatever the response is. You now have taken on a kind of obligation to change the circumstances of that reality for everyone, because listening to a story, bearing witness makes you a witness also. And, and I just think, you know, if Elie Wiesel said nothing else but those words, that is enough of a legacy. Of course, he wrote book after book after book about his experiences in the concentration camp of Auschwitz and Buchenwald, by the way, he and my father were in Buchenwald at the same time, at the same age, 16 years old. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, that another connection, well, that you're connected, um, that we're all connected, really. And so, I mean, this makes me think about um, reparations. Are reparations possible? Because I know um, in regards to Armenian genocide, you know, um, different countries accepted it at different times, you know, and um, the U.S. just recently, um, you know, said, yes, this happened. Uh, so in thinking in, in thinking about that, you know, like what um, are, are reparations possible? Because, you know, the Holocaust has has, you know, there are deniers, obviously, but it's been, um, you know, well documented. Um, so, you know, are I guess I'm asking in general, <laughs> are reparations possible even with acceptance? It's one of it's one of the most um, difficult questions for me to answer, and maybe for a lot of people to answer. I think that um, what I wrote about in Survivor Cafe was um, some of what Tanhasi Coates wrote about the effort to even acknowledge the idea of reparations in America for slavery that um, he referenced what took place in Germany over a period of decades. And that in the first couple of decades post-war, Germans were absolutely adamant that no one deserved reparations for what German, what the Nazis had, had perpetrated throughout Europe. 
and and there was even a percentage i i won't quote the number because i don't have it in my head but it was a pretty astonishingly high statistic of germans who believed that the jews were responsible for the holocaust in the early years in germany after the war that sounds very familiar <laughs> and then they came around in a remarkable way just a few decades later to the point where my parents, for example, my mother applied for reparations from the German government. And it was this excruciating process of filling out forms and being interviewed and having to prove that she was psychologically harmed by what had happened to her in the war, in hiding in a ghetto, losing all of her extended family. And this idea that Germany was taking on the obligation, I can't pronounce the German word, but it essentially translates as making good for what was done. And, and America, hundreds of years post-Civil War, post-Emancipation Proclamation, has yet to address what we really must do, not to mention what we did to the indigenous people of this country, which lasted even more than those hundreds of years. So here we are as Americans really looking at Germany and saying, huh, could that be a model for us? How did they do it? What did they do? What was required? And you know, I think it's a huge question. I am in no way, you know, equipped to answer it other than to say those things that um, that I think when ta Coates wrote his article for The Atlantic, it still felt like he was really speaking conceptually. And then now it's really like Congress is kind of taking it up as what would this look like if we move forward? What what are the what are the tangible ways this would work. And this is way beyond, you know, going back to 40 acres and a mule or, you know, it, how do you calculate something that's so incalculable? You do it, you find a way. You find a way and it might never be enough. Right? Well, and this is the thing, I think, you know, as I was researching Survivor Cafe and I was learning from Brian Stevenson, for example, the differences between retributive justice and restorative justice, you know, the difference between trying to punish a perpetrator and trying to seek out what the victim needs to be made right. And that's why the German word, which I can't pronounce, is so relevant here. It's the victims of these crimes, of these hundreds of years of perpetration, they're the ones that have to teach us and tell us what would making good look like. And it's not about, you You know, we can't punish the slave owners anymore, right? But, but can we punish, you know, what is the point of punishment anyway? I, you know, so I think it's a bigger set of questions about what does justice look like when you really ask hard questions? And it's one of the reasons I think Brian Stevenson's work, if anyone's not yet familiar with Equal Justice, his book, and then the film they made, and it, it, the Equal Justice Initiative, which is just a remarkable organization that he founded. And um, anyway, I, you know, Sorry, Ani, I'm, I, every time you ask me a question, I feel like I could talk for a few hours because these are great questions and-, and <laughs> oh, I know, you know, right? And I can listen. <laughs> it's good material, right? And I I'm, can listen forever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and and I do, I do want to ask you a few more questions, Elizabeth, before we run out of time. I mean, you did hit on, so reparations, right? So, you know, um, I know in- in Turk, in um, for the Turkish government, it's pride. I mean, that's I mean, one of the many ways denial. You know, part of the denial is pride. Um, so how how do you find a um, you know how how do you think a country like like Germany they had to find their way into the shame right mm -hmm. to um, instead of bearing it um, what you know how how does one do that how does one you know find a way to live with that shame, I guess, you know, as a country, or, you know, is, does acceptance um, get rid of that shame? 
Great question too, because I think um, I think you're aiming at the you know the underlying causes of some of this long delay or this long avoidance of of reckoning in the United States, which which by the way also includes what we did to Japanese Americans during World War II on our own soil. So you know, and not to mention what we are currently perpetrating on you know people fleeing. Central American and and Mexican cartels and drug wars that we created. And, you know, so our role in in doing harm does carry this tremendous layer of shame that that Americans aren't used to looking at. You know, we are we are fundamentally convinced that we are the good guys. We really believe that we try to bring freedom and democracy around the world and that we try and make sure other countries have free and fair elections. And we do our best to wave our flag as if we only represent goodness. And so I think to, to look underneath the, you know, the rocks and the burial grounds of, of our own pushed away shame is a very painful process. And so I don't want to simplify that. I think you're right to say that, that that's a hard question to ask. But again, not because the Germans are the perfect example. They have absolutely wrestled with it themselves. And, and it, it's not always working perfectly there either. But to see that they're willing to take it on and to say, you know, we don't have to drown in shame in order to look at this. We can we can take a nuanced look. You know, we can we can see it as um, framed by our own legacy of um, victimization after World War One, where we were humiliated, and so we overreacted to that humiliation by trying to become you know superheroes, and which made us monstrous and. You know, I think I think we can look around the world at those examples too, not just in Germany, and see how when you try and shame a, a nation, that usually backfires, right? right. So there's a question. So shame as a weapon isn't very effective. Go ahead, Mary. There, there was uh, Rob has Rob Steiner has asked a really uh, interesting question. I think it relates to a quote on one thirty five. I don't know if you have your book there. Sure. Um, but your manner and words are so positive and engaging. Given your family's history, how do you avoid cynicism and despair? It must have to do with the way you were brought up. But I'm, I'm also wondering about other writers who you write in, um, who, who, it, you, you, who you follow, Ellie Weisel and some of these folks who have had to kind of overcome a period of despair in order to put into words what you're expressing now. So I, I wonder if you could just read either a little bit of that section or um, that, that idea of how, you, how is it that you put into words. It goes back to Ani's first question about memoir and how do you articulate and express what was, is essentially inexpressible. Is it 135, is that what you said? 135 on the bottom. Yeah, um, books written by Holocaust survivors. Yeah, I have it tagged. <laughs> books written by Holocaust survivors did not appear immediately after the end of the war. There was a complicated tension between wanting to move forward and yet feeling unable to forget the past. Jorge Semprun, author of several books, both directly and indirectly touching upon his experience as a communist prisoner in Buchenwald, wrote at length about his own oscillation between remembering, writing, and attempting to choose amnesia. Elie Wiesel, one of the most prolific and recognized Holocaust authors of nonfiction as well as fiction, wrote extensively about his experiences in both Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Yet Wiesel has said that for the first decade following his liberation, he could not begin to find words. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, the idea that people now think the Holocaust is so ubiquitous in text, in film, in, uh, you know, just 
every time you look up, there's a story of a survivor speaking about their experience or their grandchild speaking about their experience. So it feels as though we've been talking about the Holocaust all along, but it's important to know that for the first few years, it couldn't be spoken about, or it, it was very, very awkwardly silently. And, and there were survivors who thought, who really believed that no one would believe them if they told what happened, that no one would think it was possible for human beings to do such things to other human beings. So here we are, here we are, where denial is still in the main center of our conversation about do I dare talk about what's happening right now in this moment where we're still, you know, honoring 20 years later an anniversary of an event where many, many, many Americans, it never occurred to them that there were people around the world who saw us as victimizers. Yes and who believed that we needed to be taught a lesson. There are Americans who will never be willing to accept that that's true. And, and I'm not trying to launch into a big dangerous conversation about 9-11 about or the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East is just, you know, the reason the Middle East is so fraught is not just because it's, it sits, you know, at the center of many religious faiths, it's because of oil. It's because of the resources that we want and believe we are entitled to. So, you know, I, I, without even calling it shame, I think you have to call it accountability. And then you have to say, like going back to our conversation about my alphabet, words are troublesome things. We don't always have the right words to speak with, but it, we, we are humans. This is our language. We do what we can. We try. We, we make the effort. We make the effort to speak. And as importantly as any other, we make the effort to listen. Yeah, was, <laughs> somebody, I'm not qualified to um, talk about the Middle East, uh, perhaps for, uh, you know, another conversation. I, but um, I do agree that for America, you know, having being first generation and watching this from that perspective and seeing the shock and horror of how could this happen on this soil was um, definitely uh, eye opening for me that, you know, oh, there are people who've never experienced any sort of trauma in their lives or have heard or um, and I just I know I know we're like getting close to the hour for, to open up to questions. I just wanted to ask you um, if it's OK about how this all connects to being a cancer survivor. And that's personal to me, <laughs> too. So, um. yeah, you know, one of the um, one of the chapters in the book is called the S word and um, a number of years ago, uh, the Huffington Post for Breast Cancer Awareness Month asked me if I would write something about my experience with breast cancer. And they said, as a breast cancer survivor, et cetera. And, and I realized in, in that moment that I hadn't referred to myself in that way, that I had breast cancer in 2009. I had breast cancer again in 2018. Um, but that I didn't use that language. I referred to myself as somebody who had had breast cancer or somebody who had gone through treatment for breast cancer. And in that wrestling with the writing about that and trying to understand why I struggled with language like that or why I avoided using that S word for myself, I remembered that my parents had for different reasons been reluctant to refer to themselves as Holocaust survivors. And so I did connect the dots right then and, and thought about that word, again, like I said earlier about the word trauma, that, that we tend to grab onto a word and think, you know, think we're all in agreement about how we're using it. And, and yet Holocaust survivors, here I go, using it as a, as a label, but, they themselves, you know, are quite different and, and often don't 
easily use words like that when some were in camps, some were in hiding, some escaped, some left Europe on kinder transport, you know, some got to America because somebody sponsored them. And then there's a lot of like, well, if you weren't, if you weren't in a camp, are you a survivor? If you didn't lose all your family, are you a survivor? And, and then, you know, some of that same kind of questioning, I think, came up with AIDS again. And there was, there was an AIDS survivor syndrome that they yeah. talked about of, you know, people who had survivor guilt for surviving AIDS when everyone else they knew by the dozens, hundreds died of AIDS. And, and now, you know, are you a COVID survivor? Are you? So I really felt like I wanted to allow myself to consider nuance with that word and also to consider what did it mean to me to feel lucky, you know, to just feel that it wasn't because I did the right thing that I survived my cancer. It, it was actually, I almost died. I, I got lucky, you know, and yes, I did certain things that, you know, I got a second opinion because it turned out the first opinion was wrong and I would have died. And, you know, and so, um, but is it because I was stronger? No. Is it because I was um, more clever? No. Um, more deserving? Of course not. So I knew many people who didn't survive breast cancer, including my mother. So what I don't say is that you shouldn't use the word, you know, like I say, use the language that you choose. And that's really important to me too, that um, as a friend of mine says, um, suffering is not a pie. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't have to divide it up and say, oh, if you get, if you get a big piece, then that leaves me a smaller piece. Unfortunately, if you're human, there's enough suffering to go around. And then some, this wonderful young woman, I, I know, um, Rachel Cerati, who just published her first book, We Share the Same Sky. And her podcast of the same name is a must listen to podcast. We <laughs> share the same sky. She, her grandmother used to say to her, and I'm, I'm probably not getting it exactly right, but it's, it's okay to say your shoes hurt, even if the person next to you has no feet. <laughs> I love Isn't that, that. Amazing. And this, yeah. and her grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. So this is this feeling that, you know, it's okay. This circles back to what we said earlier, Ani, about is it okay to talk about the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide and Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the war in Vietnam and Cambodia and Rwanda all in one book? I mean, I, I say yes, and I did because I needed to. I needed to include, and, and believe me, I could have included many more, unfortunately. So um, it, is, it is not just okay, but actually for me, it's necessary to talk about all of these things together. So I really appreciate your willingness to let me ramble on when I, when I speak. <laughs> Yeah. No, there's so many nuggets and uh, there are people just um, commenting on the side. You might want to look at that a little later of, you know, pieces that really resonated with them and resonated with me, Elizabeth. I thank you so much for sharing your um, your insights. And really, this is really the book that I've ever read that really tried to tackle you know, this big, it's a really big subject and um, of trauma and, and um, it's really the first time that I've seen it done this way and it's done so well. And again, like I said, I could, I read this book every few years because so, it's unfortunately so relevant. Um, I mean, fortunately for you, right? <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, um, you know, try, people are going, we are human and we are going to experience trauma and, you um, and this is a, a great book to read, to feel that connection. Like, oh, there's somebody else that understands um, what I'm going through. So <laughs> before we go open it to questions, there's one more section at the end of chapter two, which is called the S word, which I think is the basis for that essay you were talking yes. about. It's one paragraph at the very end. I'm wondering if you could read that paragraph right in the before three launches and then 
get your questions ready and uh, we will we will open it. Ani and Elizabeth, thank you. Really thank you. And I'm, you so we'll go ahead and leave this open for as long, uh, for a little bit longer. We started about five minutes late, so we'll go over about five minutes, but you're welcome to stay if you want. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna read um, the last page of, the last paragraph of the chapter called The S Word. Whatever we might live through separately or together, we eventually bump against the limits of language, its inadequacies and inaccuracies. After all, how could these nebulous boundaries between fact and fiction be made any more precise by words? In the zones of confusion where memory and imagination intersect, where they diverge, maybe our shared vocabulary resides most fully in the vast network of roots that sing beneath our feet, among the intricate branches rising above our heads. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I really so welcome your questions and comments. I don't know um, where we are with time. We've definitely got a few minutes for you. And, and, and while, um, while we're waiting, unless there are questions already, um, I just want to say that one of the reasons I've been talking so much about listening is that um, that's the book I'm working on now about the power of deep listening and how how that represents, you know, the pathway forward. And, um, and I just listened this morning to incredibly relevant conversation, um, Krista Tippett's podcast on being, I don't know how many of you are fans of hers, but did you hear uh, this conversation? I, I should have written the woman's name down so I can, I can call it up right now, but she is um, a forest ecologist and she's been studying the way trees speak to each other. And it's absolutely mind blowing. And, and of course it's, um, it's the oldest indigenous knowledge in the world. They know all of the oldest, oldest peoples of this planet know about the network of connection that, um, that all the living beings share under the soil and, and through their chemical communication and, um, and hormones and molecules and that we are so late to recognize these things, but, um, but it's so relevant to what's possible for us as human beings to be, you know, reconnected with each other and with the natural world. Elizabeth, when is that coming out? Is there a date? Oh God, no. <laughs> but, um, I think my editor's still here somewhere. I saw his name on there. Hi, Dan, if you're there. Um, no, it's I'm I'm working on it now, so we don't have a pub date for it. But um, but I'm working on it. And uh, I had a question. Yeah. Yeah, Ron Swisher here, and um, I didn't think I had a chance to read your book, but I picked it up yesterday at the Rendon Bookstore, and I'm a copious, avid reader, but I don't read fast but once i got into your book i finished it just five minutes before we went on air <laughs> it's extraordinary oh thank uh, you all the areas that you've covered are just amazing to me and some of you in this dialogue already addressed some of the questions i had i had tons of questions but let me just narrow it down to uh one uh you make reference to humility just briefly and i think some of the uh, resistance by so many people to accept or in denial or whatever they go through around it. Uh, even the what happened on January 6th, no one wants to <laughs> accept that, at least some people. And so, uh, because we think we're so good. So I would like to, your reflections on the importance of humility mm -hmm. and what you think of that. It's a beautiful question, and I am so honored that you um, that you read the book and and took it in so deeply. And and you know it better than I do right now because you've read it the most recently of any of us. <laughs> if you just finished it a few so minutes ready. ago, um, yeah. but I I think you've touched on something really beautiful there um, that that it's possible to feel humility and not feel humiliation. You know that that there is such a discernment practice needed in order to be um, 
to not be small as a way of feeling diminished, but as a way of being respectful and to allow for knowledge bigger than you, bigger than all of us to enter in through that landscape of, I don't know everything. I mean, I thought of myself as so knowledgeable about the Holocaust because I had spent my life hearing stories, listening, studying, reading, traveling. And yet every time I have heard a survivor story or read a new book or traveled to a new place, an entire chasm of new material opens up. There is an infinity of wisdom out there for all of us. And I think being humble doesn't need to mean anything having to do with shame, as we said earlier, that that you can subtract that feeling of, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't not know these things. It's like, it's okay to not know things. It's okay to be a beginner. It's okay to learn, you know? It's okay to look back at your own behavior and say, wow, that was unconscious. I, I need to wake up and do better. And I don't know if that in any way answers your question. I think it's a really beautiful and complicated one. Thank you for it. Ron, you're muted though now. Sorry. I think uh, it helps tremendously. And I think the book you're working on with listening will probably touch on it even more so. You're absolutely right. And that's why it feels like the exact right next book for me to write. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Any I want to thank you, Mary, for putting all those links in the chat. I hope people are um, are noticing it, just not just to buy the book, but also to know that um, I actually did the audio narration. So you get to hear me read to you for um, nine hours and 14 minutes. It's really good. It's really good. I, I, that's how I read the book the second time is did the audio. And it, something about walking and listening at the same time was... You know, really, I have, really, really moving. thank you. I have to tell you the most amazing thing. I was on Kauai a few months ago and I met a woman who um, she has a swimming pool with audio piped in. <laughs> she listened to Survivor Cafe floating in her in her pool. And I just thought when she told me that I decided that I had died and that I was I was in heaven. And this was a conversation I was having in heaven because there was something I'm a swimmer and I love water. And this idea that she was hearing me read to her underwater just somehow really blew my mind. But recording the book was really powerful for me. I have to say, you know, having lived with the book internally mm -hmm you know, for, for the two years I, I was writing it, which by the way, was the fastest book I've ever written because it was just so somehow needing to come out of me and do all that research. But, um, but reading every word into, into a microphone in, you know, with my headphones and it, it was, it was really profound. So I'm very grateful when people listen that way. Can you find the audio at uh, a rental bookstore? That's a really good question. I think you might need to do it online. Okay. There's a, before we are about to run out of time, before we do, it, it does link into what Elizabeth was saying earlier. We, our next reading at Alta Mesa Center <clears throat> is in celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day. And it features James Thomas Stevens and um, Aja Duncan, and it benefits the Segura Land Trust. I'm, I'm saying that wrong. So go, does anybody know how to say that correctly? Segura so Tay Land Trust. And it's run by indigenous women in the San Francisco Bay Area. And the idea is to raise money for land that was unjustly taken. And it supports both the communities, but also an effort to buy land back for indigenous peoples. So if you have a chance to do to take a look at the program, it has much more information on the program, which is the link right above. We also have a two, sun, uh, two Saturdays a month, we're starting a generative writing workshop. The first one is on the 2nd of October and we're, we're gonna talk about memory and remembrance. And we're gonna work through um, in two weeks, two separate weeks, ways of using text. And we will be using some of Elizabeth's text to give words, give voice to 
memory that perhaps has been suppressed or uh, has not found voice before. So take a look at that in the program. I'm gonna back out again. I know that there's more questions um, in the room. So thank you for coming. I'll leave the window open as long as we need it. Um, but for Elizabeth's sake and Ani, who probably exhausted, 5.15 will probably be the end of questions. So. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say thank you, Mary, for the creation of this space, which um, is really a tribute to the vast uh, network level functioning of your mind. I, I really, I was on Kauai when, when Mary and I were kind of brainstorming about, about this event and it was just so fun to talk to you and to realize that, um, you know, just a little spark can become something quite abundant and, and important and meaningful. And I really want to thank you for, for your sensitivity and your depth and your breadth for that matter. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's so great that I get to see everybody's faces too. I'm, I've been in gallery view this whole time, just so I can see all of you. So, um, I know not all of you, if you want to open your video up so I can see you, that would be cool. If you want. Hi, Laura. I see you. <laughs> Laura, Hi, Laura Davis has an amazing new book coming out soon. The, oh my God, I should know that the bright, the, say it, Laura, the title. Can you unmute yourself? The, the Burning Light of Two Stars. Ah, lovely. If you have a link, Laura, please feel free to use the chat. Sure. The Burning Light of Two Stars. I just did an interview with Laura for the Los Angeles Review of Books that's going to come out. And it's it's an incredible story of mother-daughter reconciliation after a long, struggling lifetime of um, relationship. And it's it's beautifully written and really powerful, really I think it's going to speak to a lot of people in this moment. Thank you. Patty Jocelyn says, uh, I think the thing we have here together, breathing, listening, is surviving, is surviving. She said, what a, whoa, what a lovely statement. Mm -hmm. This is what connects us. This and pain, history, and hope. Thank you, Liz, she said, for keeping creative communication open. And here's Patty. There she is. Hi, Patty. <laughs> Waving from Vermont, yay, with Charlie. Is that Charlie in the background? Hi, Charlie. <laughs> oh, I see, there's Charlie. <laughs> Any uh, other questions from, from the gallery or uh, comments? Don't be bashful. Again, um, I think you balance, am I, can be heard? There's Ron. Speak up a little bit more, Ron. Yes, I, I think you balance the past with the present and with the hope of the future. You start off with the Shakespeare quote, mm -hmm. the past, our uh, prologue. I thought of uh, Faulkner you saying that the, uh, the past is never dead. In fact, the past is never past. Mm -hmm. And so we dealing with that past and how you remember it and cherish it, but yet you have to move on. And I think you do a wonderful job of trying to keep that balance in your book and with all the uh, tremendous examples, but you don't want to stay there, but you want to remember it and you move on. Thank you for saying that. I really, um, I feel like that truly encapsulates the struggle we've been talking about for the past hour of, um, you know, looking back doesn't mean only looking back and looking forward doesn't mean never looking back, you know, that we have to figure out how, how to balance all of these together. And a Holocaust survivor said something again, so precise and, and succinct. Um, I do not live in the past. The past lives in me. And it, and again, this idea that that we can acknowledge it and and name and do our best to name as as we've been saying you know some of it is unnameable and unspeakable but and that includes people who have been through sexual trauma for example that often these stories simply do not get to be told for any number of reasons for re-traumatization reasons whatever whatever the reasons are for 
for survivors of any trauma not to speak. I have no judgment whatsoever about those who choose not to tell their story or are unable to tell their story, but to simply allow that it's true, you can be in the present, carry the past inside of you and continue to live into the future with what you carry. You know, the other thing that's so important to understand about epigenetics is that these changes don't have to be permanent, that the way we're impacted by trauma doesn't doom us forever to keep passing along that traumatic residue, that we can choose to do something to transform and to heal. And, and I don't say that in a simple way. I think that takes all the tools we have available to us. But this idea that, um, that we're supposed to not look back in order to be in the present, I think is, I think is really missing out on something essential about, about the human species. And also really, again, to refer to the natural world. The natural world is carrying, look at an acorn. An acorn is holding a whole tree inside of it. You know, that's not just the future, that's the past also. The acorn came from some other tree that held its own story. I mean, we can learn so much from, from what we're surrounded by. I have a question about you uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. um, your whole bearing is so positive. Mm -hmm. Positive, and I'd I'd like to know uh, uh, the secret, or or if you if it's something you can explain, and I'd also like to know if you discovered very early on that you were a writer. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny; those two questions are are kind of connected because um, I. It's funny; I don't experience myself in the way that I think I must come across as being so positive because I. <laughs> I, I am my mother's daughter as well as my father's daughter. My mother suffered from severe depression. Um, she suffered from bipolar disorder, which was diagnosed very late in life. And, and my father is like this incredible optimist, but also is, is, you know, in the blink of an eye, could go into a deep state of grief over being a survivor of, of, 1.5 million children that were murdered, you know, all of his classmates were killed. So I feel like I often exist right on that edge between those two states and that, um, and that it takes effort actually to, to stay hopeful for me. I, I, I am less of an optimist than my father, I think, but that what that did was, I think, give me a really, um, if I can borrow Laura's verb, burning, a burning need to express myself and, and to do that through art. And, mm. I, you know, I wanted to sing and dance and paint and perform and play the flute. And, you know, I did all of these art forms as a child because it felt so necessary for me to find a way to release all of this feeling that I was carrying and including deep sorrow, including um, grief and loss and pain. And um, so writing eventually became the place that felt like home to me. Ani and I were talking a little earlier about home and, and writing is, is a home for me, even though sometimes it's really hard and really uncomfortable um, to be transparent on the page or to be willing to um, make a mess and to be awkward and to not know what I'm doing and to write myself into a corner and, but Bob, if you, if you look at my other work, you'll see that these themes do recur for me over and over this question of how do we hold what we carry in a way that doesn't just keep knocking us to the ground and making us, you know, just immobilized by sorrow. So it's, it's a daily act of courage, really. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I think that's probably a lovely, lovely way to end the day. Um, thank you again to both Elizabeth Rosner and Ani Tashian. This just was wonderful. And in the epilogue, she quotes the spiritual, let my people go. I thought that was a great touch too. Yeah.
Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Ani. Thank you, everyone, Thank for being you. here. And we will see you hopefully in a few weeks, uh, about a month. And uh, let us know if you have any questions or concerns. The, the piece of paper I Zoomed you in the chat has email addresses and all of that. So thank you. Please buy Survivor Cafe if you haven't already. <laughs> yeah, Arinda Books has lots of copies. They're ready for you. Hard copies. Um, the audio, again, is wonderful. It really is. If you get it anywhere else, you can still leave and a review on Amazon. It's okay. In fact, do that. Um, support your yeah. local, support your, your local. <laughs> and also, and I, you know, if I'm allowed to say one more thing, um, if you, if you read and, you know, like any of my other books and, and you want to be in touch with me, my website has an email address. You can always communicate with me. I love to hear from people who have read my work and want to, you know, connect for whatever reason I teach. I, coach i you know i i'm around i'm available i'm on twitter i'm on instagram i'm not much on facebook but um the evil empire i try and steer clear of that one but, uh, yeah say hi anytime and thank you all it's really it's a privilege to get to speak in in a meaningful way with all of you thank you thank you good night <laughs>